Hello, and welcome to Stories Behind the Songs. I'm Jim Tompkins, and in each video episode, I tell the backstory behind a famous rock or pop song. Today's song is Hurricane by Bob Dylan. Hurricane is one of the most unique songs in the annals of American pop music. It was written by one of the most iconic American singers of the 20th century. It was an attempt at a factual account of a contemporary crime where a person was convicted in serving time for murder and at the time the song was released, it added to a groundswell of support that wound up getting the accused conviction overturned. So let's jump right in and unwind this fascinating story. It's 1975 and Bob Dylan is an American icon. He would burst on the scene in the early 1960s as a charismatic folk singer with songs like Blowin' in the Wind and The Times They Are a-Changin'. He then moved into playing rock music and had tremendous success with albums like Highway 61 Revisited, Blonde on Blonde, and others. He'd released over a dozen original albums, sold millions and millions of records, and was idolized for his poetic lyrics and enduring music. Off in a parallel but very different universe, we have Reuben Carter. His life is just as eventful as Dylan's, albeit with a lot more challenges and struggles. He's born in 1937, just a few years before Dylan. Early on in life, he gets into trouble and spends time in boys' reformatories. He even runs away from one of them, but eventually joins the U.S. Army. His time in the Army is no better. He's court-martialed four times and gets discharged in 1956 after being deemed unfit for service. But during his stint in the Army, he spends some time boxing, and not only that, realizes he's phenomenally good at it. After his Army discharge, though, he's right back in trouble and winds up spending several years in prison. In 1961, he gets discharged from prison, and his life finally moves in a better direction when he starts boxing professionally. He's a middleweight boxer, shorter than average, but with power. In his career, 19 of his 27 wins come via knockout, and he's given the nickname Hurricane. By 1965, Ring Magazine has him ranked as the number five middleweight boxer in the world, which would wind up being the pinnacle of his boxing career. It's in the following year, in 1966, that Reuben Carter's life changes forever. At approximately 2.30 a.m. on June 17, 1966, two men walk into the Lafayette Grill in Patterson, New Jersey, and begin shooting. The bartender and one customer are killed immediately. Another customer dies shortly after, and a fourth person survives but is blinded in one eye. Witnesses describe two black men as the murderers and the police pull over Reuben Carter and his friend John Artis, who were black, but otherwise don't fit the description of the killers. Initially, they're released, and Reuben Carter briefly resumes his boxing career. But two months later, he and Artis are arrested and charged with the murders. The case hinges on the testimony of two men, Alfred Bellow and Arthur Bradley, white men with criminal records who claim they're en route to rob a factory when they witness the shooting, and that Carter and Artis are the killers. Reuben Carter and John Artis are both found guilty, Hurricane getting 30 years to life, Artis getting 15 to life. Bradley and Bellow both were promised reduced sentences for their crimes. There's a huge amount of controversy around the case and the verdicts, ranging from allegations of faulty evidence and questionable eyewitness testimony to an unfair trial. Nevertheless, Reuben Carter and John Artis go to prison. Where the story takes another big turn is while in prison, a writer helps Reuben Carter write his autobiography, which he titles The Sixteenth Round. The book is smuggled out of the prison and published in 1974. A number of celebrities like Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, Joan Baez, and Joni Mitchell start talking publicly about his plight. Reuben Carter then sends a copy of the book to Bob Dylan, and Dylan reads it while on a flight to France. He's so moved by Reuben Carter's story that after he returns from France, he arranges to meet him at Rahway Prison in New Jersey. According to Reuben Carter, they hit it off and make quite a connection. It was after meeting Carter that Dylan decides he'll write a song about him. According to George Lois, a famous ad man from New York who took up Reuben Carter's cause, he helps persuade Dylan to write a song about Reuben Carter in a meeting they have in Connecticut. Whatever the motive, in the song, Dylan wants to tell the story of what's happened to Reuben Carter and how he was framed. He'll use the notes he took when he met Carter, along with the autobiography, as the basis for the lyrics. The interesting thing, though, is that Bob Dylan, despite being a master lyricist and songwriter, is not a great storyteller in his songs. So he recruits a man named Jacques Levy, a stage director and lyricist, and asks him to help out. Levy agrees, and they set out to write the song. 
As Levy says of his role, Bob wasn't sure they could write a song about Hurricane. I think the first step was putting the song in a total storytelling mode. I don't remember whose idea it was to do that, but really the beginning of the song is like stage directions, like what you would read in a script. Pistol shots ring out in a barroom night. Here comes the story of the hurricane. Pistol shots ring out in a barroom night. Into Betty Valentine from the upper hall. She sees a bartender in a pool of blood. Levy also said, I think Dylan liked the idea that I could tell a story. Bob's not that good at telling stories. He doesn't go from A to B to C to D to E. He's got a lot of good stuff in his songs, but they don't usually add up to a story. This is interesting to me because one of my favorite story songs ever is Tangled Up in Blue, which was written by Dylan. It tells the story of a couple who keep getting together and breaking up and follows them on their journeys in life and throughout the country. She was married when we first met, soon to be divorced. I helped her out of a jam, I guess, but I used a little too much force. We drove that car as far as we could, abandoned it out west. Split up on the docks that night for the green it was best. She turned around to look at me as I was walking away. I heard her say, But I do remember reading where Dylan said it was a very difficult song for him to write, and it took him years to get the story straight. So that seems to add up to what Levy is saying. With Hurricane, Dylan and Levy take a lot of liberties with the lyrics, particularly with the dialogue parts of the song. And unusually, they use the actual names of the people involved, such as Patty Valentine, who first discovered the crime scene, and Bradley and Bellow, the supposed witnesses. When they finish it, what a story it tells. From the setting of the scene to Reuben Carter's rise as a boxer, to the crime unfolding, the trial, and Reuben Carter winding up in jail, everything is in the song. Reuben could take a man out with just one punch, but he never did like to talk about it all that much. It's my work, he'd say, I do it for pay. Most pop and rock songs use some variation of a standard song formula. Verse, chorus, verse, chorus, then a bridge, then a final chorus. Some songs have two verses, some have three. Hurricane has 11 verses and 11 choruses. There's no bridge in the song. The verses lead quickly into the choruses with no break, and each set of verse chorus is separated by just a very brief violin solo. Another thing that's unique is that most choruses are refrains, which is a recurring phrase. The words stay the same, or maybe just have a small variation. But in almost all the choruses of Hurricane, Dylan uses different lyrics that help to continue the story. It's as if he wanted to cram as much information into the song in as short a time as possible. Dylan heads into the studio in the summer of 1975 to record the song. The first version is slower and has some different lyrics than what we now know on the released version. In those 
lyrics, it turns out, are a little too dangerous for the record company. In one line, he talks about Bradley and Bello robbing the victims after they're killed, which they're never accused of. These lyrics freak out the lawyers at Columbia Records who are worried that lawsuits will be flying. So Dylan needs to change the lyrics. The first thought he has is to try editing out those controversial parts, but that's too difficult to do given the structure of the song. So he just decides to re-record the whole thing. In this version, he speeds up the tempo and modifies the lyrics, and his vocal performance has more fire and brimstone. The result is a song that has a more powerful effect. It's the version we all know today. The musicians he uses are the musicians he's preparing to tour with later in the year. This is his famous Rolling Thunder Review Band. In September of 1975, a few months before the song is released, Dylan's invited to perform at a tribute to John Hammond, the legendary music man who had originally signed him. The performance will be filmed and later shown to a worldwide audience on PBS. Dylan accepts at the last minute and pulls in the Rolling Thunder Review Band, but only tells them they have a gig to do in Chicago. So they show up and realize they're going to be performing as a band for the first time in front of a live audience that includes all the top executives at Columbia Records for a performance that will be filmed for a worldwide audience. But they pull it off and do a spectacular job. This performance can be seen on YouTube and is a remarkably well-preserved video. You can hear some of those different lyrics that he winds up changing in the final version. This video has just recently surfaced and it's an incredible time capsule of Dylan performing live in his prime and as far as I can tell is the only live video available to the public that shows him performing the song Hurricane, which is an interesting topic that I'll revisit later on. The song is released in November of 1975. It's the timing of the release of the song that I find so incredibly unique. What Dylan is doing with this song is akin to throwing gasoline on a fire. The fire being the groundswell of support that's building for the injustice that has been done to Reuben Carter. The case had huge publicity when it initially occurred, with headlines nationwide including in the New York Times. Reuben's autobiography is then released in 1974. Celebrities left and right start jumping on his cause. The two key witnesses in the case recant their stories, which is made very public. And then in the midst of all this, an eight and a half minute song which line by line describes the saga is released to the public. It's so long at eight and a half minutes that it can't even be put on one side of a single and it's split up into two parts to take up both the A and B sides. The song garners rave reviews and is one of Dylan's biggest hit songs of the 1970s. Billboard declares that it's probably the most powerful song Dylan has recorded in a decade. Record World says, the story's true, and the names haven't been changed to protect the innocent. And Dylan doesn't stop there. In December, he and his Rolling Thunder Review play a benefit concert in Madison Square Garden that raises $100,000 for Hurricane Carter in his defense. He's joined by Joan Baez, Joni Mitchell, and Roberta Flack. And at the beginning of the song Hurricane, he says, We gotta get this man out of jail. Then in late January the following year, he and his review hold another charity concert. Hurricane 2 at the Houston Astrodome, where they're joined by Stevie Wonder and Isaac Hayes. And in 1976, Dylan performs Hurricane during every stop of his Rolling Thunder Review tour. Around the time that all this is happening, Bradley and Bellow change their stories, claiming they were coerced into their testimony. That and Dylan's involvement in the advocacy by George Lois and other celebrities helps Hurricane Carter and John Artis get their convictions overturned and they're granted a retrial. But in a repeat of history, they are once again found guilty of the crime and sent back to prison. And with that comes the end of the story of the song Hurricane. But that is not the end of the story for the actual Hurricane, Reuben Carter, as well as John Artis. In fact, the most fascinating left turn in this incredible story is yet to come. That fantastic twist begins with a boy named Lesra Martin. Lesra Martin is born and raised in New York City. His parents both have drinking problems and wind up falling on hard times. By the time Lesra is 11, he's already working to help support his family, and they live in the worst neighborhood in New York City. In the summer of 1979, his father takes him on the subway to start a new summer job at a Brooklyn environmental lab. There, Lesra is befriended by a group of Canadian entrepreneurs who are visiting the lab. This group winds up offering to bring Lesra to Canada and fund a better education for him, away from the gangs and drugs that are prevalent in his neighborhood. 
It's a difficult decision for his family, but they let him go. The group that Lesra goes to live with in Toronto is no ordinary family. They're a communal family, very principled, founded on the do-good ideals of the 1960s. They are also entrepreneurs and share a single bank account, and drugs and alcohol are strictly forbidden. Shortly after he arrives in Canada, Les receives the cover of Reuben Carter's biography at a Toronto library book sale. He can't even read at this point, but he sees something in the cover, a close-up photograph of Hurricane Carter that speaks to him. His new family begins reading the book to him, and he actually learns to read and write from the experience of reading the 16th round. After finishing it, he pens a letter to Reuben Carter. Reuben Carter by this time is 43 and is basically resigned to his fate to spend his life in prison. He stops seeing visitors and cuts himself off from the world. Then he gets the letter from Lesra Martin. Shortly after that letter, Lesra Martin visits Reuben Carter at his prison in New Jersey. It's after that visit he tells his family, we have to help this man. He and Reuben Carter strike up a correspondence and the family begins to help Reuben's defense team, who have never stopped fighting for him. Eventually, several members of the commune actually relocate to New Jersey so they can better work on his defense. They help his lawyers uncover fresh evidence that he'd been framed by corrupt officials. And finally, in 1985, Reuben Carter wins his exoneration in a U.S. federal court, a verdict that overturns the convictions against both he and John Artis. From that time until his death in 2016, Reuben Carter was a free man. And this remarkable story comes full circle. Here are a few other interesting facts about Reuben Carter and the song Hurricane by Bob Dylan. After Reuben Carter was freed from prison, prosecutors appealed the judge's ruling and filed a motion to bring him back to prison pending the outcome of the appeal. The court denied the motion and upheld the judgment. The prosecutors then appealed all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, but they declined to even hear the case. Reuben Carter moved to Toronto after his release to live with the communal family that had helped free him. He wound up marrying Lisa Peters, the woman who had spearheaded the commune's efforts. But that life wasn't for him, and eventually he split with Peters and left the commune. He did continue to stay in touch with them and remained always grateful for what they did to help free him from prison. Reuben Carter's final boxing record was 27, 12, and 1. His final fight was a loss to Juan Carlos Rivera in Argentina on August 6, 1966, nearly two months after the Patterson murders and before he'd been formally charged. After leaving the commune, he continued to live in Toronto, where he worked as executive director of the Association in Defense of the Wrongly Convicted. Lesra Martin, the young boy who was working to support his family when he met the Canadians, went on to attain a degree in anthropology from the University of Toronto and a law degree from Dalhousie University in Halifax. After practicing law in Canada for some time, he embarked on a career as a motivational speaker. Patty Valentine, who lived above the bar and discovered the crime scene, sued Bob Dylan for defamation, claiming she suffered emotional distress because she was mentioned by name in the song and portrayed as a liar. Dylan himself said he had put her in the song because she had such a beautiful name. The case was eventually dismissed. When Reuben Carter and John Artis were freed on bail prior to their second trial, most of the bail was paid by Muhammad Ali. Interestingly, Muhammad Ali and Reuben Carter did not get along prior to this point, but Ali was persuaded to go and meet with Carter in prison, and there he agreed to help him. Scarlett Rivera was the violinist on Hurricane. How'd she wind up being involved? Dylan was being driven in his limousine through Greenwich Village, and he spotted her walking with her violin case. He stopped the car to talk with her and invited her to his rehearsal studio, and boom, she was in the band. She can be seen performing the song with Dylan in that 1975 PBS special for John Hammond, and she was part of the Rolling Thunder Review Tour of 1975 and 76. She's since gone on to release multiple records herself and has appeared on albums by artists including Tracy Chapman and the Indigo Girls. Jacques Levy, who co-wrote Hurricane with Dylan, also co-wrote the majority of the songs on his Desire album, the album that featured Hurricane. He also was the stage director for the 1975 and 76 legs of the Rolling Thunder Review tour. The line in the song, He Ain't No Gentleman Jim, refers to Jim Corbett, a white boxer in the late 1800s known for his manners. In the song, Dylan calls Reuben Carter the number one contender for the middleweight crown, which is a great example of the liberties he took with the lyrics. 
In reality, by the time of the murders, Reuben Carter had fallen to the number nine-ranked middleweight, and he had passed the prime of his career. The story of the hurricane made it to Hollywood in 1999, directed by Norman Jewison and with Denzel Washington portraying Reuben Carter. Denzel would win a Golden Globe for Best Actor for his performance and be nominated for an Academy Award. The final interesting fact about the song Hurricane is a mystery. After performing Hurricane on every one of his Rolling Thunder Review tour stops in 1976, Dylan has never again performed the song. There are several theories as to why this is. The leading theory seems to be that the song is just too long and complex. But that doesn't make sense to me, because musically the song is actually not that complex. And Dylan plays other lengthy songs live and frequently changes the tempo and style of the songs. So complexity wouldn't appear to be an issue. Another theory is that he just doesn't want to perform it anymore. And there's many songs that he's only performed a few times, and some that he's never performed at all live. But that doesn't add up for me either. He didn't just perform Hurricane a few times. He performed it at two benefit concerts and on every single stop of his tour in 1975 and 76. Then he suddenly stops and doesn't play it for the next 50 years? My theory has to do with something I read in a biography of Reuben Carter years ago. After Reuben Carter was found guilty at his second trial, Dylan broke off contact with him. Public opinion had been on Reuben's side in this trial, and no doubt he had a more sympathetic jury. But still, he's found guilty again. A lot of the people that supported Reuben Carter dropped out at this point. Reuben wanted Dylan to visit him in prison, and Dylan refused to and never had contact with him again. My guess is Dylan felt burned by supporting him and maybe realized he was in over his head by very publicly supporting someone who he doesn't know 100% is innocent. In his life, though Dylan penned many famous protest songs, he was himself not really a protester. He didn't show up at marches. He didn't turn up at the sides of people and causes like Joan Baez and others did. That was just Dylan. But he's never directly talked about why he doesn't perform the song Hurricane. And my guess? He never will. That wraps up the story of Hurricane by Bob Dylan. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed it, please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. And I'll be back soon with another analysis of a great rock and roll song.